Hi, thank you for joining me and my stuffy nose. In part one of this series, we did some data wrangling to download a big pile of drought data from the U.S. Drought Monitor, and we uh, we unzipped it in a bulk fashion and we flattened it in Windows into a single folder, and then we brought it into ArcGIS Pro, and did a merge to put them all in the same layer, and then looked at some visualization options that we had just to explore the data. And now in part two, we're going to do some analysis. So let's get rocking and rolling. So I'm changing this to an equal area projection because that's a very important step in this analysis because we're going to be binning things up into hexagons of equal size. So from the data, we have a, an attribute called DM. and That's like drought magnitude or something like that. Like how strong was the drought? And I want to create a derived uh, thing that I can use to um, color code this stuff later called power. Um, and I'm, I want to use DM for that. And so I'm going to create a new field and I'm going to calculate its attribute. Now drought magnitude starts at zero. So what I'm going to do is add one to it and then just square it. And I mean, the easiest way to type that in for a stooge like me is just to multiply it by itself. So DM plus one times DM plus one and ka-chow. We've got an attribute that I can use to uh, visualize by later. So I'll close this. And the next step is to open up our analysis tools, geoprocessing tools. And we are going to generate a tessellation. Tessellations are awesome. They are, think of them as like a tiled floor, right? It's the same shape repeated over and over again with no gaps. And it's great in GIS because we can aggregate stuff up into those zones of fairness instead of arbitrary political areas. And I'm going to use a transverse hexagon, which is the cool way, hexagons that are pointy side up and down instead of flat and boring. And I'm going to make them 1,000 square kilometers in area each and use my equal area projection as a reference here. And then it's generating um, what turns out to be about 7,000 little hexagonal polygons there. Pretty cool. Well, so let's just uh, get rid of the fill here so we can see what it looks like. Give it kind of a nice architectural blue. Now there is an overlay. It's a lot like a fishnet. We've just cast a net over our stacks and stacks of drought polygons. <clears throat> and in the previous video, we looked at the drought polygons and we realized like, Visualization is going to be really tough with this because there's so much overlap happening. Well, what we're going to do is flatten it into one layer. So using a spatial join, I'm going to put the drought information into the hexagons, which is frankly just magic. Um, I'm going to name my output feature class, and I'm going to go down into the attributes area and say for the power field that we created, add all those up. So every instance of drought that happens within that polygon, add that power value up. And we're going to say have their center in so that we don't get uh, duplication of values. Uh, and this took about a minute and a half. And here we are. It's all done. Um, see, took about a minute and a half. There's the elapsed time. Okay. And what it does is it creates another layer. So I'm going to turn off my old empty hexagons, turn off my drought data. And now I've got this magical uh, data packed layer of hexagons here. So let's let's translate data into knowledge a little bit and start looking at what we've got. So I'm going to use um, uh, scaled symbols to represent this data instead of dots, which is the default. I'm going to use a hexagon because that's my area. Um, but they aren't rotated the cool way. So I'll go inside the symbol properties and I'll just rotate it 90 degrees. See, so now the, the pointy sides are up and down. All right, we'll hit apply. We'll go back. Now the smaller the hexagon, the less in, less months that drought was there, and the bigger the hexagon, the more months of drought it endured within 2018. And I'm just resizing this until I get a value where they all start to just kind of touch each other at the, at the maximum end. And I'll get rid of this default um, outline for the areas just so we have dot. And it actually kind of looks cool, like newsprint at this point. So instead of the default natural breaks, I'll choose equal interval and I'll, I'll give it a bunch of classes that it can span over. So it's got kind of a nice um, continuity of small dots to big dots based on the number of months that it has endured drought. And there you go. So 
we'll take a look at this and see, like in the ocean and everything, you've got just dots everywhere for values that mean zero. So what I'm going to do is just get rid of that, get rid of those, and I'll say for join count, which is every polygon that added up into that hexagon, if it's not zero, show it. So hide everything that has zero incidences of drought, and then we'll hit OK. And there we go. We've really cleaned up the visualization. We've got a map without any extraneous uh, little hexagons all over the place cl cluttering it up visually. So let's take about take a look at the symbology attributes here. So what can we do with this? Uh, well, we've we've graduated it by the number of months it was in drought, but not every month of drought is the same, right? That DM thing and then the waiting power that we gave it means like how strong was that drought? And so we're going to do what's called a bivariate map, where scale means how frequently it was in drought, and now color means how powerful was that accumulated drought. And I'm using a cool um, Viridis color scheme here, and I'm going to reverse this color scheme because I've got a light background. So light means um, just a little bit of drought intensity, and dark means it was really intense at this place. Whereas scale means if it was it's very dense, it means it was like solid drought the whole duration of this year. And then if it's a smaller hexagon, it means drought was relatively rare there. So we're showing two dimensions of data at the same time, a bivariate map, two variables at the same time. And you're cramming some pretty cool data in here and information, which means we're going to have to do in a follow-up video, some interesting things with our layout to provide context. We're going to have to add a legend to really explain what's going on here because it's kind of complex. So stay tuned for that kind of stuff. So what have we just done? Well, we've created a field. We've populated it. We generated a tessellation. We did a spatial join, which again is just black magic amazing stuff to geographically aggregate data. And then we played around with some bivariate symbology using color for intensity and size for duration. And thank you, as always, for spending this time with me. I hope you learned some tips and tricks and things that will get you rocking and rolling making these maps. And we'll see you next time on video number three.